Um, for those, uh, lots of familiar faces. Uh, for those who haven't been before, the culture sessions um, are a monthly meet. For those who have, they're really bored of me saying this every month. Uh, it's a <laughs> monthly meeting of people online across Cheshire East um, to talk uh, from programmers, producers, individual artists. Um, and uh, we started being Cheshire East wide. We then, with the support of cultural destinations, moved to um, being Cheshire wide. And now, obviously, with the benefit of being digital, means we can uh, invite people from further afield as well. Um, we meet on the third Monday of every month from four till five p.m. usually, and quite often have a guest speaker. Um, Oh, and on that, I don't think I've said this recently, but um, we normally come up with the speakers or the themes, but if people want to suggest people or themes, then just drop us a line and uh, send us ideas or pop something on the uh, Facebook group. So there's a Culture Sessions Facebook group as well, um, where you can share opportunities or yeah, suggestions for stuff to talk about. Um, the meeting is being recorded, I should say. Uh, so yeah, keep you cameras off if you don't want to be recorded um do uh, introduce yourselves in the chat so that we know who's here and where you're all from that would be great um what else our next meeting uh, is on uh, the 19th of april uh, at four o'clock and we've got joe verant uh, and ma uh, somebody else with Joe, uh, Marlo Savin from Unlimited. And they're going to be talking about their commissioning process, but also challenges around commissioning and ethical commissioning as well. Um, so we'll send out the, we'll, we'll put up on, on Facebook and send out to those, subscribe to the email address so that you can sign up for that one, uh, probably at the end of this week or beginning of next. Um, I think that's probably it for the introductions. Oh, and just to say as well that we are really hoping we're going to have some live uh, culture sessions meetings as well. We've got one planned uh, at Chester Zoo later in the year, and hopefully we'll be able to get round, get together around the campfire uh, and toast some marshmallows soon as well. Um, it'd be nice to see some in life in person faces. Um, but for now, uh, I'm really, really pleased that we've uh, got Sally Carruthers here, who um, hopefully I'll get the um, I'll get the, the your job title right, Sally, is the exec director of the Poetry School, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, Sally's uh, here to talk to us. Uh, the Poetry School are a national arts organisation uh, involved in providing tuition mm -hmm. and opportunities for poets and poetry audiences. And um, Sally's going to talk to us today um, about uh, m managing the Poetry School in under these uncertain times that we've been in and fundraising and partnerships and how they've managed to develop and to an extent thrive under the quite challenging conditions that we've had. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Sally. Thank you very much. Um, and it's great to be with you today. And as Hayley and um, Clara know, I was petrified thinking I'm going to have absolutely nothing to say to these highly informed people who probably know more about this than I do. And I was sending emails saying, um, well, there's a reason, you know, Ted only has 15 minute talks and everyone's going to be bored witless if they have to listen to me for anything longer than that. Um, but then I actually sat down and started doing some of the work and I thought, you know, actually, we've all been through an awful lot over the past 12 months. Um, and there is quite a lot to talk about and think about. Um, and it was great to be asked to this by Wild Rumpus because um, a partnership has kind of emerged from that. Um, so it's kind of really the synergy there and exciting things too. And um, I know how hard and how absolutely appalling a lot of, you know, the past year must have been for you and sleepless nights and terrible stress. And so, you know, I don't have a magic wand. I can't tell you what to do because everyone's challenges are different. So, but what I thought I'd try and do is share a presentation with you, which has not one single graph in it, has a minimal amount of doom and gloom at the beginning, and hopefully, you know, might be enjoyable and might prompt some questions. And if the technology works, I will be so thrilled. I've had to engage a 17 year old to help me with this. So anyway, it's kind of, 
securing funding and partnerships in uncertain times. Um, oh, it's worked. <laughs> so anyway, I don't really probably need to spend too much time on what these uncertain times actually are, because we all know about this. And um, obviously the impact of the pandemic on the UK's cultural industry and um, has been greater than anything else. Um, as you probably all know, Arts Council England announced its first kind of COVID funding in uh, March, I think, because we had to scramble together an application because Poetry Schools and Arts Council National Portfolio Organization. So we put in a bid from for that and got some funding. We actually um, were quite modest in what we asked for, which is why I think we got the full amount. Um, and after that, as you can see, kind of the House of Lords um, did a report in September, and then the government announced 1.57 billion, kind of of their own funding. So uncertain times, they certainly are. Um, and I don't want to kind of dwell too much on funding from those sort of sources, because I'm sure you're kind of all over that. It's just what we all have to do now. Um, the Office for National Statistics reported a 44.5 reduction in monthly GDP output for the three months up to June 2020, when we were all panicking. Um, so obviously April, May and June. I shut the school down on March the 13th completely. We teach face to face and online. Um, historically, face to face has always been our biggest area of provision. And we're a national organisation because we've had little enclaves in Manchester. We run our MA with Newcastle University. We've taught in Bristol and in Exeter. I've co-curated the um, Old Poetry Festival. So we do, we have, a, we've had face-to-face -face live activity nationally. And our online students actually come from all over the world. But the face-to-face -face has been our biggest kind of revenue stream. Um, the only sector which um, we were second to in terms of reduction in income and things was actually the accommodation and food service industries, which had an 86.7 decrease, unsurprisingly. So as you can see, I thought I'd find a picture of a very sad, empty, but rather beautiful looking museum to highlight kind of that. So you kind of then think to yourself, well, what do you do in this situation? Everyone needs friends, you know, we all need people to talk to, but how do we find them? And then how do we nurture them during a period where everybody is in a state of either, you know, looking at the bottom line and having sleepless nights or thinking, I can't deliver anything. You know, my 95% of my business is, has had shut down. Over 70% of workers in the cultural sector were furloughed. I didn't furlough anyone, but that was because we we're a really tiny team. And I just thought we can deliver what we do online, but I completely appreciate that, you know, not everyone has been in that position. So kind of, I think one of the most important questions that we've all been asking ourselves is like, who are we really? When things like this happen, it's like, well, you can kind of potter along for a bit and say, well, who are we and what do we do? But it's scenarios like this where you go, really? You know, is this really who we are? And I think when you're up against the wall, um, that's when you, it really kind of focuses your mind and makes you really question who you are, what you're about and what you can do. And I think this Martin Luther King kind of quote always sticks with me. It's like, we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And I think I'm really proud of us as a sector. And, you know, thank you for coming today because it's testament to the fact that whatever you face, you're still going strong. And there's another King quote, which says, you know, if you can't run, walk, if you can't walk, crawl, you know, you just have to keep going. Um, and I'm thrilled because I think the theatres are going to be open again soon. And I saw some people you know, on the participation list who are part of that. And that's me really so exciting and heartening. And I think maybe we're at the tipping point now where we can kind of start tentatively to get excited about stuff. I couldn't resist putting this in, I'm afraid. I apologize. And I think this is this is again is like has has struck me. There's a quote from Dr. Seuss where he says, 
as I'm sure you all know, says be who you are and say what you feel because those who matter don't mind and those who mind don't matter. And I hope you kind of, that's what I felt. It's like crisis faces the mind. You really find out who your friends are. And I think sometimes we don't quite realize how many friends we got. And I hope that you listening have, have had experiences whereby you've perhaps thought, gosh, I didn't think they were my friends. And, and someone stepped in and helped you at a time you've really needed it. Um, I'll say a bit more about the poetry school, but not too much. Um, we are an MPO. We were set up in 1997 by three poets around their kitchen table who thought, hang on a minute, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, Royal Academy for Art, there's a Academy for Music, there's um, the Royal Ballet School. Why is there nothing for poets that, that will nurture and train and teach poetry and poets? So that's kind of why we set up. And we've grown from then. I started in 2016. Our website is shockingly appalling. Again, COVID has really um, made that stand out because we would probably all agree that we've done kind of three years of um, online development in the space of about three months in 2020. Um, so we, for instance, put all our courses online. You can see Website's awful, so my next job and our next job is a team to kind of make it something really exciting in a kind of post-COVID world. Um, we do, we teach, we review, we do all sorts of things. We're like a talent development agency for poets in the UK. Um, we also run uh, two Eho Poetry Prizes, which is why we've had the serendipitous uh, opportunity to engage with Wild Rumpus. And there's another link which I'll bring up earlier. But a lot of this presentation is really about building relationships, you know, securing funding and partnerships is really about securing and sustaining relationships with people. Um, I worked in the kind of private sector before I kind of came into this sector. And I worked in publishing, for kind of Vogue and GQ, and I worked for the Telegraph newspaper and international syndication. And my boss there once said to me, he said, Sally, he said, you know, what people do is people either buy people or they buy projects. It's much easier for people to buy into people. Um, and I think as a sector, we're really fortunate, the cultural sector, because there are so many amazing, inspiring people in it. We're not selling piping for plumbers. You know, we're, we're providing people with something that makes their lives a million times better. The reason I've kind of brought up Ginkgo is poetry is notoriously difficult to promote. It's kind of seen as tricky and not very exciting. Definitely not glamorous. Um, so throughout my time at the school, I've really tried to find hooks for the poetry to kind of promote poetry on. So for instance, the environment is obviously a no brainer. And we were very fortunate because we got in ahead of the curve because I've got um, a lot of my family and background is to do with environmental issues. Um, so we took on the Ginkgo Prize for Eco Poetry, which is the world's biggest prize for eco poetry. And is being judged this year by Simon Armitage and Jade Cuttle. Um, it's 5,000 pounds and anyone can enter, anyone can write a poem in English and enter. So we run that and that was a brilliant hook to hang poetry off to raise funds, to, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, to raise funds and you, you know what it's like, your core costs or your kind of overhead. With poetry, you need a hook. You guys probably do much more exciting, glamorous stuff, <laughs> but with poetry, you really need a hook. Um, so we run that and we do a lot of activity around it. Um, so Wild Rumpus, I think we're doing a free co-poetry workshop, which we will fund ourselves. We do that all over the place with different partners, the area of outstanding natural beauty. We've got an amazing partnership with Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about that later. Um, so we do the Ginkgo Prize. We also have our MA in writing poetry. That was a bit of a challenge during COVID because we're kind of the tiny partner with Newcastle University. 
Um, and they were very uncertain about what they would be able to do, what they wanted to do. We have a cohort in London, which who we were teaching face to face. And obviously they have a cohort up in Newcastle and we have our own tutors and we run our bit from the school. Um, it was much easier for me to be able to just say, I'm shutting the school, we're gonna run it online. Newcastle were kind of hemmed in by the parameters of what the bureaucracy of the university did. So they kept umming and ahhing and coming back to us. And I was saying earlier, it's kind of, it's really difficult to stand your ground, but it's harking back to that. Who are we really? And I think if you feel confident we just plowed ahead. So we were kind of this tiny thing standing up to the university saying, actually, no, we're not gonna cut it down from eight seminars in a term, well, 10 to eight. We're just gonna carry on doing what we're doing and do 10. And they were like, you're gonna And then they'd come and say, you've got to do this. Um, the, the students have got to have two hours face to face a month. And then they'd come back a couple of weeks later and say, the students are not at all allowed any face-to-face. -face. It's too dangerous. And I felt really sorry for the people, the administrators and the people in charge there because we just carried on, I have to say. We're, you know, a bit rogue. And eventually they went back up to 10 um, module and 10 sessions and this, that and the other and ended up really back where they'd started. But I think it's really important to kind of stand your ground, even if you're little, and say it's, it's okay we, we we've done this we think it works we're going to carry on um so kind of being a bit that also off the record that ad is not approved by newcastle but um it's got their logo in and i'm sure they'll love it so again that's an art that's an advert for um an academic ma they don't often look like that they kind of look really quite dull so that's something we've been doing is kind of agitating a bit and disrupting partly because we're awkward but I think Covid again has given everyone a sense that there are no rules really to play by because all the rules are being rewritten by the government or by whoever so kind of if you feel you can write your own rules and revise what you do I don't know how much face-to-face -face we will now do going forward it will almost be I read an article by um kind of trend predictor in the states right at the beginning of the um the whole pandemic and he said that tertiary education will become a kind of face-to-face -face tertiary education will become like an elite luxury product it will become like the Chanel <laughs> or the Gucci or the kind of Louis Vuitton of educational provision actually sit in a room in a university with a human being and that students will want to buy into global brands in terms of education so they can do an online course with Harvard and get a qualification to put on their CV and it will be a far lower price point. Um, so I think university education is going to change forever from this point onwards and I think it's really tough for anybody in that sector at the minute. Um, so anyway, we're doing that. If you love poetry, come and do our MA. It's so fun. There are only 12 people in the cohort. You've got two world-class tutors who you see every week and the prizes um, and publishing deals and things that our students have achieved are jaw dropping. And I think it's because we are small and it's exclusively poetry, there's no more. That's the only plug I'm doing, right. No more plugs for all the stuff, but the MA is fun. Um, so when you go, right, this is us, we're gonna be small and fierce and disruptive. Um, and then you think, well, who are our friends? And actually, if we behave like that, who will want to be our friends, which I often think. So uh, I thought quite hard about kind of how to do this bit. And I thought I'd better put something serious, like a list that people could copy and, and take home with them, which might be practical assistance. Because um, I'm meant to be kind of saying how you fought, you know, achieve funding and partnerships in these uncertain times. Um, so I thought what well, best thing to do rather than bore you rigid, hopefully, is kind of give you some examples again of what, what we've encountered and what we've done. And I'm 
quite robust. I get told no on a very regular basis and I never take it personally from anybody. I just think, oh, maybe I need to think about that a bit more because people, other people are invariably right and I'm usually wrong. Um, but I thought what I'll do is give you some examples of these type of people, you know, the people who are your friends and, and how to keep them as your friends. So stakeholders, obviously suppliers managing upwards. I seem to see that a lot with my board. Um, team, clients, funders, partners, advocates, peers and competitors. And I stuck competitors in there this afternoon because I actually thought mm, you can learn an awful lot from your competitors. So they are kind of your friends because they're they're teaching you. Um, so they're, they're the sort of groups that I think you probably should just look at and think to yourself, maybe create a list put people next to them or organizations. And I think what you'll find is a lot of them cross over and that particularly with projects, someone can just start as maybe a funder, but they might then actually develop more of a partnership relationship. And ultimately what you want is them then to become an advocate for you. As you, I did, I'm telling, I've looked at the list of people attending this and I'm teaching grandmothers to suck eggs so I apologise because I bet loads of you know way more about this than me. Anyway, I thought I'd tell you about British Land, who are our landlords, which initially sound less than exciting as partners or funders, but actually they're one of my biggest funders, one of our biggest funders, because British Land are doing the biggest commercial property development in the UK at the minute, which is £7 billion worth of development in East London in Canada Water. And the poetry school used to be based at a very unpleasant, highly dodgy um, site on Lambeth Walk, which necessitated battling with a kind of terrifying estate to actually get to the front door. And at that time when I started, a lot of our students, it's changed hugely, were kind of terribly nice, bit elderly ladies for whom walking through a kind of gangland London Southwark was not really what they necessarily wanted to do. Also, the station wasn't accessible, there was no lift, uh, the station was uh, over half a mile away from the school. So you kind of want to think about, well, we want to make the organisation accessible. So we decided we were going to move. So that was my first job, was moving the whole school. Um, Thinking about managing upwards, if you want to move a school, it's a really good idea to have a commercial property lawyer on the board. <laughs> so, so that's what I did. A friend of mine is a commercial property partner at a big law firm. And um, my current chairman is a commercial property lawyer at a big London law firm. And so he had all those networks that we would need to try and get somewhere cheap, but really good, because he had his finger. So, Kind of when you think about your board, think about who you need and when. And they always say with boards, you need four W's, I think it's four. You need wealth, wisdom, wit, and wow. So make sure there's a lot of cash on there, particularly for difficult times like this. I mean, off the record, my three of my board members have given the school over 50,000 pounds over the past 12 months as individuals. So you want money because you just need somebody who you can say, can you give us 10 grand? And instead of going, what? <laughs> they say, yes. Um, so get some people with money. Uh, wisdom, I'm sure we all know there's endless wisdom you can have on a board, but you don't want too much of it. Wit, it's always good, even if you're poetry, which is not the most glamorous, um, to have someone witty or exciting and the wow factor is just I don't know we kind of shy away a bit from that um, yeah there's nobody kind of we've got amazing poets um, Mona Arshi is on our board who's got a quite a big profile but nobody on a kind of I haven't got any celebs I certainly haven't got any royals or anyone <laughs> which is obviously uh, at the minute problematic for people anyway. Um, but I'd say money is always a good thing to have on your board if you haven't got it. Um, so British Land actually said to us, yeah, we'd quite, you, we'd like you in our development. And we are most, well, we negotiated a deal whereby we get 40,000 pounds off the rent every year. 
So already they're one of my biggest donors because over the past three years, they've effectively given us 120,000 pounds. Last year, I renegotiated with them and said, I can't afford 40,000 pounds a year, I'm really sorry. And they said, okay, we'll drop it another 10. We were paying 50, it's now 40. And since lockdown, I've not paid a penny in rent. So again, that is hugely helpful in terms of just buffering you and relieving financial pressure. So weird people can end up being your best friends like British Land, obviously the Arts Council is our best friend. I put in an application to Garfield West and I won't talk too much about trusts and foundations because there's, again, I'm sure you're all better at it than me. But um, I'd put in an application to them just before COVID hit and they wrote, as you know, to everyone saying, do you want to alter what you've written? Do you want to ask something else? And I actually said, no, I don't. I still want you to fund whatever it was. And they gave us the cash, which was nice. So I don't know what we can learn from that, but anyway, the team, I think another of those little headings is absolutely critical, particularly during COVID. It's so difficult for everybody. That kind of communication internally, I think makes a huge difference. And you know, your team are stakeholders and they're probably your best advocates because you don't want them going home going, oh, it's awful, I hate it, I can't stand Sally, she's so irritating, you know, we're not doing anything interesting. So it's kind of this quote that says in teamwork, silence isn't golden, it's deadly. And I, I agree with that. I've spent more time, I think, with the team on Zoom as individuals and as a group. We have a small core team of about seven people who do everything and way more than they should. Um, but they've been amazing through lockdown and they've been, they're happy. And to be honest, that's all I care about. So to have kind of a team that managed to, to survive and we've got, you know, some fairly vulnerable people on the team and then all the um, kind of freelance tutors that we have, because all our tutors are poets and they're all freelance. So kind of trying to keep a grip on that I think if you can it's really helpful and I'm guilty of kind of thinking oh I could speak to that person next week but I think proactively engaging all your team again I'm sure I'm sorry because I bet you know all this already I just think is really helpful particularly during Covid and in terms of sustaining partnerships and kind of communication Kind of clients, funders, partners and advocates, you kind of want that group to actually be one person because it's almost like a journey. They start off, as you all know, kind of tentatively and then you can bring them in. I thought I'd tell you about this, if you can see it, which we've managed to kind of carry on. I think the strength of your relationships pre-lockdown will ensure that they thrive post-lockdown. Um, this is a picture. It's actually, you will know, I think, this charity. It's a charity called Onside Youth Zones. There are about, there is one in Manchester, they're building another one. It's a, it's a charity based in the Northwest. Oh, this is Prezi Video. And it's brand new from Prezi. And it's so easy to use, even I can do it. And it has loads of templates. So that's what this is. Whoever just asked what presentation thing is this? Um, this was a kind of serendipitous thing. And I think we should all be constantly aware of serendipity. So on this photo here is um, a very lovely woman in the middle who is now on my board. Helen McCrory's there in a gold dress kneeling at the front and Damon Lewis is at the back. And this is kind of embodies relationships because this is a group of young people from the Onside Youth Zone in Barking and Dagenham. And Onside, if you don't know, it was set up by a load of entrepreneurs in the Northwest. A guy called Bill Holroyd, who actually was, I think he was Lord Lieutenant of Cheshire. Because have you now got, I'm trying to think who it is now. Anyway, these entrepreneurs set up this charity based on Bolton Lads and Girls Club because Bill went in there and thought, my God, this is a model that every young person should have in the UK if they need it. So they create these amazing 21st century youth zones, which are open all the time when school is not. And they give young people somewhere to go, something to do. 
and someone to talk to. One in four of these young people get in one-to-one -one mentoring from a kind of professional youth worker. So I worked for them before I worked for the poetry school. And again, it's all these networks and the chap who's the chair of the charity in London met this lovely woman who said, she said, I love poetry, um, but I'm loving this youth zone idea. And he said, he said, speak to my friend Sally. So she spoke to me and funded a programme in the youth zone whereby we sent a poet who's also a trained youth worker in to work with these disadvantaged young people, you know, whom literacy is, is a... Anyway, Yomi Soda is fabulous if you want to do anything like that. And serendipitously then, Kate ended up on this poetry event at the... That's the um, City of London Lord Mayor's Mansion. And these young people came and, and read their poems there. And it's kind of, it just seems to me emblematic of how good relationships work. You go into it thinking you're gonna do one thing and then you end up and these young people are reading with Helen McCrory and Damien Lewis. And you, you kind of go, how did that happen? And as a result, I'll be applying once we're out of lockdown for a kind of big Arts Council grant to roll this out through 10 youth zones nationwide. And again, it's a bit like the eco hook. You know, the Arts Council suddenly say to me, uh, we want you to engage with young people. And I'm thinking, but you've not told me that before and it's not what we do. So you kind of have to think to yourself, how can I access like 350, 400,000 young people a year, deliver something meaningful, and then report back to the Arts Council say, you told me to do this, I've done this project, this has the potential to reach 350, 400,000 young people, and they're happy because their box is ticked, and I'm really happy because we're doing something fully funded, which is really meaningful and has impact um, alongside our kind of core activities. So yeah, thinking kind of creatively about how you can access audience that you want is also, I think, really key. Um, this is interesting. You probably all know, do you know Aesthetica magazine? It's, it's fab, isn't it? I mean, it's really beautiful. I love it. It's, it's not poetry. They do a poetry competition every year. This is a relationship which has developed and a partnership explicitly during lockdown. And it's one which is not all about money. It's about kind of reciprocity, um, which again is something that's really important, particularly when people haven't got money, you know, no one's got money to splash about. So again, it's, it, it's that kind of serendipity. Kate Simpson, who's the associate editor there, who's based in York and is utterly brilliant, wanted us to offer a prize for their poetry competition, of course, so we did. But then you kind of think, well, how can we develop that relationship? Well, now we've got a free quarter page ad in Aesthetica each issue. We're going to provide a judge for their poetry competition. We're talking about us providing poetry programming in a kind of interdisciplinary section of what we do. So, for instance, they're interested, as you know, in kind of sculpture, visual arts, film. We do, we kind of do that. So there's a poet, Yomi actually, again, who did the youth zone. He's about to be published by Penguin. He did a poetry lecture on Caravaggio violence and the representation of black men in contemporary Britain. I said, he could do that again for your audience, which is kind of right up their street. So we're looking or, you know, sharing newsletters, you know all this stuff, sharing newsletters, you let people take over your Twitter feed, um, you know, you, you have all this marketing stuff. I know there's some marketing experts in the audience, so I'm not going to say too much and reveal my ignorance. But, you know, Aesthetica also has an audience of like 400,000 people worldwide. They're an audience I'm not already reaching. So people will say to me, shall we have half a page in the poetry review? Sally, they've, they've been on the phone. Do we, want, do we want to advertise? And I'll say, no, of course we don't. They, you know, if they're reading that, they know who we are. We're not advertising with them. <laughs> so horrible. Um, but someone like Aesthetica, I get really excited because I think there's all those people 
who have this peripheral interest in poetry and probably never thought they might want to write it, but we can kind of do something fun with them. And it's a great brand to just associate with. And that's why I keep banging on about serendipity. It's like finding something good without looking for it. That's kind of, I had to go back to my uni and they said, oh, will you come and do um, a, a careers thing and a talk on your, I said, but I don't have a career. <laughs> it's like never had a career. I've never had a plan. And there were all these poor like freshers and undergraduates who when I was there, I'd have been in the bar. I certainly wouldn't have been in a careers thing. And I think the others were, there was someone from the House of Lords. There was an amazing guy who'd done all the kind of um, partnerships, the massive partnerships for the Olympics. And there was Plum Sykes, who, who's just works for Vogue and is terribly like this. And then me, and I think I hopefully managed to say to these kids, just take opportunities and see where it leads you. And I think now more than ever, that's what we all need to do. And, and Mr. Serendipity, here's a, here's a good one of Serendipity. I'm sh you all know who that is. Our poet laureate, Mr. Simon Armitage. Um, he became laureate and decided to um, give his laureate stipend a whacking great five grand that he gets for being the poet laureate. Can you imagine if he gets 5,000 pounds? He wanted to give it to a kind of eco poetry prize. So I kind of put my hand up and said, um, Simon, you know, uh, we, we're kind of doing one already. Yes, it's actually the biggest in the world. Um, we, you know, we'd be honoured if you wanted to do anything with us or can we do something for you? Because we think it's amazing you're doing this. So he sort of says, sorry, uh, yeah, that sounds, yeah, I think we'll do that. And um, so we differentiated his prize by it being best collection and the Ginkgo Prize's best individual poem. So that was a funding nightmare because I had a terrible donor who promised to fund the whole thing for 10 years and then, of course, didn't. So I said, I've got the poet laureate, like, how's the funding coming? I'm fine, it's at fine time, don't worry, it's all good. And behind the scenes, I was thinking, when is this check coming? Oh, anyway, it did, but I got bits of cash from other people. And I think, you know, they say never be funder driven. And I now understand that completely differently. I used to think it was never be funder led. So don't let a funder come in and tell you what project they want to do. I now see it as being, never be funder led have like try and line up funding don't believe them that if they say they're going to sign a big check so that was awful but it worked really well simon's thrilled we've now gone global in the second year so we're accepting submissions from publishers all over the world who um have collections in the english language and we're going to be at cop 26 but in terms of partnerships again it's the eco element that's interesting it's enabled us to partner with Client Earth, which is a global charity, which has the is, is a bunch of lawyers who have the Earth as their client. Say so they will campaign, they will get, you know, coal power stations shut down in Belarus because they act on behalf of the planet and all the people who live there and all the animals. Um, so the other one we've partnered with, with Ginkgo's uh, Global Witness, who, um, again, it's, it's more lawyers, kind of environmental lawyers, who uh, basically act for um, environmental campaigners who are killed because hundreds are killed every year. So all these partnerships aren't just about poetry, they're about other things. And through the other things, you kind of get to grow your organization bizarrely. Um, so yeah, we'll probably go to COP26 because of Simon, who has his side hustle as a DJ and musician, which not everyone knows about, will be at Wild Rumpus, which we're thrilled about, um, doing a reading, the winner um, of Ginkgo, I think, is coming, and I must invite you to the Ginkgo ceremony, which will be in Richmond Park um, on May the 19th, so if anyone's interested, let me know. We also partnered with the areas of outstanding natural beauty, again for the poetry school, fabulous, because there are 62 across the UK. Apparently a lot of their people love poetry, we didn't really know. And so they sponsored a prize. And then because of Simon, it, it is like my brain is a bit like a spider's web, I think. Um, we 
got a wonderful partnership with the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which you can be happier about, which I'm sure you've all visited because it's quite near. And Simon has been a long term supporter of the Sculpture Park right from its very beginnings. And so we're going to hold the prize ceremony there um, in the autumn. We wanted to last year, obviously, but sadly um, ended up doing it online. But again, you think to yourself, well, do we just want to do a prize ceremony or not? So what we're going to do is work with the Sculpture Park to provide a whole kind of day or weekend of eco poetry activities, you know, children's trails, which highlights the work of the park uh, and how amazing it is, highlights the prize and it's kind of everyone wins. And, you know, it's great having Simon as laureate because he just adds extra excitement to it. Um, I couldn't resist this. This is one of my favorite partnerships ever. Yes, you are reading that right, it's Cartier. <laughs> so we, I basically put poets in Selfridges paid for by Cartier at a very decent rate for an entire month in August in 2019 because they did this huge pop-up for this brand called Clash de Cartier. And um, they had poets, as you can see here, the lovely Victoria Bully and Teresa Lola, who's Young Laureate for London, with typewriters, and people could go in and have a haiku written by the poets. Um, on Cartier kind of cards, you got to take it away for free, and I was able to pay poets a really decent chunk of cash for four hours work, which thrilled me because kind of that's what I'm about paying people properly for, for the work they do. So that's kind of not a, a COVID one, but that's just one of my favorites because it's the last place you would expect to find poets. And as a result, we ended up sending some to Joe Malone in Heathrow in Terminal 5 one Christmas to write little haiku for wealthy uh, Terminal 5 people who wanted to buy things for their wives on the way through the airport before Christmas. So. Again, it's like unexpected things are always the best. Okay, I'm nearly finished. During lockdown, we all know we've had to kind of embrace technology because it's the only way to reach people. So I thought, you know, social media salvation or everybody loves a freebie. We've really kind of upped our game with what we offer for free. Um, so we used to offer a, an in-face thing called Write Ahead at the Poetry School. Do you see what we did there? Write Ahead. And it was for people who'd never written poetry before and they could come for free. But obviously we were limited to kind of 14 people and they'd walk away with a poem. And I think we gave them some crisps if they were really lucky while they were there because they tend to be younger people. All they had to do was come with their pencil and they could write a poem and take it away with them. So we did that and we do X a number a term and it would cost us money because obviously we were paying the poets, but we had, it was part of our social outreach um, accessibility budget. But what we've done during lockdown is we've expanded that quite dramatically. Um, so we're doing free Instagram live workshops, um, paying the poets because it's, you know, obviously we're committed to that. We're not, we don't ask anyone to do anything for free. Um, and we've expanded our audience. So even though you feel trapped, you can expand your audience because people are so hungry for decent content and things to do that we've, we've done an awful lot of this. I'm also lucky enough to work with somebody who has a really good visual aesthetic. So I've got somebody in house um, who's able to create stuff like this at the drop of a hat. Um, so this is from the Laurel Prize Instagram. And um, what we've done with that is kind of highlight the winners, highlight poems, the judges' poetry. This year we've got Imtiaz Darker, Maura Dooley, and James Thornton, the CEO of Client Earth, who's also a poet to judge. So we just create these things which, you know, builds audience, really. That one's a nice one. Here's um, Maura Dooley. What we thought we'd do for a whole month was a kind of, we, we themed it largely on monthly basis. So we're saying, well, while everyone's trapped at home, we asked the judges to give us a poem which would take people traveling without having to leave where they were. So you can see that's called Manzanir Algeria, Alger, 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 Allegria or something by Maura Dooley. And it was about traveling without leaving your home. And um, so we put the poem on a couple of 
those here's another one this is actually women's history month so we did a themed kind of social media across twitter instagram for women's history month and that's an emily dickinson i've also got a copyright lawyer which is really useful who's my coo who does one day a week with us and I think that's something I always feel is, you know, one day a week of someone really good is better than five days a week of somebody who's not that interested. Um, there's another one from Jazz. This was actually for World Wildlife Day and that's the Ginkgo Prize um, uh, Instagram feed. And here's just an example of, we offer the free workshops on Instagram Live, but then we, we create an asset so that if people can't attend, they can benefit from it. This was amazing because this woman, Elena Karina Byrne, is a poet and she's the poetry director of the LA Literary Festival. So she's hugely well connected in the States. So we said to her, would you like to do uh, an online workshop for us? And she said, yes. So we thought, oh God, she said, yes. What do we do now? Because uh, it's going to be midnight or something. <laughs> no one's going to be able to attend. So we said to her, well, would you do it at 9 a.m. in LA? So it's kind of 2 p.m. East Coast, and then it's about 7 p.m. across Europe, so people can take part. And so she said, yes, yeah, that'd be great, I'll do that. And she did it brilliantly. Um, all these workshops are funded by the prize itself. I set up the funding model for the prize with cash in there to run free stuff, um, which with a prize is a bit unusual, but working with the donors what we want to do is raise awareness of eco poetry um and so it was important to provide people with learning opportunities as part of the model you probably can't see that but it's kind of takeaways from elena's workshop so again it's like everyone loves a freebie and this has grown our audience kind of online quite dramatically and we've had people in Australia saying, you know, I participated, it was 3 a.m., but I set my alarm and got up and I loved it. So kind of makes it worthwhile. Um, your peers, your, you know, that kind of frenemy vibe. It's like, we're all in the same sector. We're all kind of doing similar things, um, but actually, you know, we're all in the same boat at the minute. So these are just a few people who we partner with and have ex expanded the partnerships during COVID and lockdown. I think that's the important bit about this is kind of how we've added value or given more. So Creative Future, I don't know if you know about Creative Future because there's Creative Futures and they're both based in Brighton. So it's hugely confusing. Creative Future is a group for marginalized writers. So they could be refugees, they could be economically disadvantaged, they could be uh, racially marginalized. A lot of them are disabled. Um, what we've done is we've provided a prize we've offered kind of one-to-one -one mentoring or whatever on a yearly basis they have now wanted to apply to the arts council for a bigger chunk of funding for their alumni so all their winners and so i've been well we've been part of that bid and we've said we'll do this we'll do that we'll do all sorts of other things and um, I suddenly said, God, what we should be doing is having a full scholarship for our MA for marginalised writers because they are by nature invariably, you know, disadvantaged economically by disability or race or status. And so I've now managed to raise during lockdown the funding for a full scholarship for a marginalised writer to do the MA, the poetry. Um, so that sort of stuff is is so worthwhile and I'm really pleased. And again, it's an individual donor, but to be able, you know, it's relationships. If you can go to people and just say, how, look, we're doing this. I mean, you know, all this stuff, I'm really can't apologize because it's probably like basic level fundraising and I'm really sorry if you're bored witless, but it's just been about thinking, how can we develop these relationships during lockdown. So the Rebecca Swift Foundation is a women's poetry prize and writing prize. There, it, it was being administered by Victoria Duque Bully, who, who we know as a tutor and adore as a friend. And she came to us and said, um, you guys are doing a lot of stuff on Zoom, aren't you? Um, you've done Simon Armitage's, would you host this for us on Zoom? And so we're like, yeah, of course we will. So we hosted that um, on Zoom. 
and it's just a good thing and we give a prize giving a prize is we find is quite easy we do a lot of giving prizes the Ledbury Poetry Festival is actually about the Ledbury Emerging Critics Group again it's a, a BAME Latinx um, kind of professional development scheme for marginalized writers well we're now paying one of them as a paid editorial assistant one day a week because I firmly believe in kind of supporting them. And also we used two of them as sifters for the Ginkgo Prize. So they did the first cut, but it's something, and we paid them, which they can put on their CVs. So all these things, I just think helping other people to the extent you can repays dividends. Um, but, uh, happy ever after, if only. <laughs> well, at least we might be coming out of lockdown. Um, what I did was I thought, God, it's so airy fairy and rubbish, this presentation. I'll have to put another list of something at the end for people who like lists and things they can tick off. So that's just a kind of, you will all know this anyway. It's, a, it's just a kind of donor development partnership thing where, you know, research, identify, cultivate, ask, negotiate, close, steward. It's kind of, it's boring and I'm so, but, it might be of use um, if you've not seen it before, but I bet you've all seen it 50 times. So I shall kind of, if you want to write it down and it's just really, you can apply that to anything. But one thing I think I've learned is with trust and foundations, treat them like individuals. Again, that's kind of basic fundraising, but see if you can get somebody on the board or so that when they're in the room making that decision about a trust application, somebody go, uh, I really think this is really good. You know, what they're doing is excellent if, if you're eligible for that funding. Um, and finally, I just kind of want to thank you all because you're such a diverse audience and you're all hugely knowledgeable. I apologize if very little of this has been relevant or a tiny bit, but it's great that I think we're getting to the end of this. And if, you know, if any of this has been helpful at all, I, I just want to share really my thanks. Um, we all face these horrible challenges at the minute. And if we can all keep going and while Drumpus is kind enough to, you know, facilitate things like this, it's fantastic. And if you've got any questions you want to ask me, please do. And I was trying to work out with them any of my friends were in the audience going, we're going to ask you some really nasty questions. <laughs> so I was like, no, stay away. But thank you for listening. Um, I hope not too many of you are asleep. Um, and yeah, please ask me any questions you wish. Ellie, that's been brilliant. Thank you so <laughs> much for joining us. Like just, yeah, so positive and optimistic and hopeful, I think. Um, it, and, and I just think it's so refreshing, isn't it? It's so easy to think about where the money is and uh, following the money as opposed to that, just building relationships. It's just such a brilliant approach, isn't it? Like, actually, and, and of course that, that the good things will come if you build those great relationships. Um, please put your hands up, people, if you have questions for Sally. Um, Otherwise, I will ask you one of the many questions. I've got loads, Sally. <laughs> um, who does your fundraising? Is it predominantly you or do you have more? It, of it's it's me. Ever? It's just you. It's you. It's me. And it's kind of like everybody. We all kind of sit there and you're thinking everyone's meant to engage in fundraising. And, you know, the Arts Council kind of said to me, do you want to apply for, for funding towards fundraising? And I was like, well, actually what I'd like to apply for is funding towards a trust and foundation expert two days a month because and they were like no 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 you can't have it for that we want to train your whole team and your board and I thought they're not going to do anything with it just you know I think we all know don't we we're kind of put in these positions where you think but I know what we need but just like that with practical assistance and then the Arts Council has a strategy whereby they want every single person your organization to be doing fundraising and it's just never going to happen so yeah I do it primarily the board are good I mean as you can see they come up with cash and really good amounts of cash and I think working for on-site users where it was a board made up of entrepreneurs where one guy had pledged 10 million pounds over 10 years 
and one of the others, it's actually the chap who owns AO.com, um, who did that. And the chairman gave seven and a half million in one year. When you kind of see those sort of people and it was run like a business, you realize as a kind of arts charity where the dead weight on your board is. I know this is a really indelicate way of putting it, but someone once said to me, it was an American woman actually, America's quite ruthless about boards. She said, oh, they're just a board whore. I said, what do you mean a board whore? She said, they don't read the notes, they turn up, it makes them feel good. They wanna stick it on their CV. She's like, get rid of them. <laughs> And I think if you've got anyone like that on your board, might be time. And they're always the hardest people to shift, but you kind of, the board is critical because its job really is to help with fundraising at a kind of strategic level, but all too often they just like swanning in and turning up at the events. So I kind of do it, but it's a big part of my job. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like it, it must be. Um, I would say that we don't get any money from anyone on our board, uh, but we do. Know, but, we do get, but we do get a lot of other brilliant stuff. We get a huge amount of support and friendship and advice and guidance. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so if everyone else is sitting there thinking we don't get ten million, well, from do our, you know what someone once said to me as well? And I do say this to my board every year. I say. Um, well, as you know, kind of fundraising or, or what, it, and it can be commercial fundraising too. It can be like investment um, is part of your remit. So, you know, it would be great if you could all give something to the extent you can. And, you know, it can be a tenner. I've had poets on the board who've given a tenner and that's fine. And I say, because you see the trouble is if you don't give something, you can't really ask anyone else to give because their first question to you will be, well, if you want, you know, what are you giving? And I'd say, so I am a bit, I'm just kind of saying, well, you know, it, it doesn't matter how much, but it's just the act of giving kind of demonstrates to other people your belief in the organization. Um, one of my other questions, Sally, uh, someone else stick your hand up if you've got one. Um, one of my other questions was about sponsorship as well. So like, and yeah. I mean, I feel like you've got everybody in this big relationship bubble where there's like clients and funders and, and trusts and foundations and, and, they're, and they're all like just extensions of that, whether they're individuals or businesses or, um, yeah, I just wonder if you've got much that, much that is like commercial sponsorship. Uh, less so without question, but I mean, effectively, Cartier was a, it was a kind of commercial partnership um, they effectively paid us a kind of professional fee, which we then paid the poets chunks of cash. Um, the AOMB is, is, is effectively a corporate sponsorship because they fund a couple of prizes um, and various sort of activities. Um, but as you know, kind of we're a registered charity, so corporate sponsorship's funny. Um, and you can only give kind of a, an in-kind benefit that's worth up to about £25. Um, otherwise, the tax man will come after you and sponsorship attracts fat. And, 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 I mean, it is different from a donation. But I know that, you know, as a festival, sponsorship's critical, kind of corporate sponsorships and partnerships with drinks manufacturers and all that stuff. We do less of it. In terms of booze, it's normally one of the board pays for a load of wine if there's a big event or a prize given. <laughs> so it's, it is different. Yeah, sure. Have other people got other questions? No, in which case, um, Sally, that was brilliant. I really, <laughs> I just, it was just so, it was really, really exciting. And it wasn't all stuff that we all knew before. So please don't think that. No. Um, and uh, I, was just gonna, I was just gonna say, there is a question in the chat. Oh, from, sorry, um, sorry. Somebody that'd be worth, uh, so um, I don't know who it is actually, but it, um, just about COVID changing international engagement and what your advice is for reaching out internationally. This is really weird. Um, I'd love to say, you know, we created a strategic program of global engagement, but we haven't. I think what we've done is it's grown organically because we've had tutors historically who've taught. 
So there's a poet, for instance, who lives in Beijing, who's taught an online course for us. Um, and it's grown like that. What happened? It's difficult if you don't have an activity people can engage in. Um, we're lucky enough to kind of have that. So we now have cohorts of students taking a class and one will be in New York and one will be in somewhere else, you know, and two will be in wherever. And so the tutors like it because they get a really different kind of perspective, but we haven't. We've done it effectively by stealth marketing. I always call it like stealth marketing. So we've promoted the prize, which then kind of encourages engagement. We've then used people like Elena Karina Byrne, who we know and who's the poetry director of the LA Literary Festival, you know, to promote things like the Laurel Prize. I guess it's you kind of have to think um, about who you know who's got a relevant contact in a different place. And we've marketed the Laurel Prize by doing things like there's a wonderful poet in India called Tishani Doshi and we created a kind of international graphic for people so we've sent that to her and I've sent it to Linda Gregerson who's head of poetry at um, Michigan State University and he's taught for us and um, Tish, you know Elena said she'll she'll um, promote it to her networks we did an activity with Ginkgo again it's like stealth marketing whereby we got the top kind of eco poetry anthologies in the States and then um, kind of contacted eco poets. So it's, again, it is literally about building relationships. I mean, what's fascinating is we were desperate to get hold of this woman, Camille Dungy, who created the black anthology of eco poetry in the States, which is 400 years of, of kind of black eco poetry. And she was really hard to get hold of because she's so kind of well known and big. And then Jazz, um, my colleague, created a graphic of one of her poems. We spoke to her agent, but at this point we couldn't even speak to her, we just spoke to her agent. Created the graphic and then she suddenly wrote saying, I absolutely love it. And we were then in a position to say, would you maybe like to teach for us? Would you like, you know, is there something you'd like to do? So. Again, it's kind of freebies. Everyone, she loved the graphic. Um, she's called Camille Dungy, C-A-M-I-L-L-E-D-U-N-G-Y. She's fabulous. Um, and again, with Aesthetica, it's really weird because Kate Simpson, um, who's their associate editor, I didn't realize, but she'd actually been in touch with me. I just hadn't put the two together because she was creating kind of eco poetry anthology and wanted the contact details for some of our winners and she's also the associate editor at Aesthetica so we've now got this deal with them but in addition to that she's just reviewed Simon Armitage's new collection on our website because she's a really good reviewer so it's we have not had it's really difficult to kind of actively market globally if you don't have a presence somewhere but if you have contacts and networks you can kind of think around it a bit, I think. Yeah, it sounds like you do a lot of like following the momentum and following one person onto another and making those connections, which is uh, super inspiring. Well, thank you so much, Sally, for being with us. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> appreciate it. And um, Sally did a really brilliant job as well of plugging uh, Timber Festival and the fact that they're going to be there as well as Simon Armitage DJing from the uh, trees. Yeah. So, um, yeah, oh, wait. <laughs> that's the beginning of July um, and presumably Sally will be inviting all her rich donor friends with her as well so we can all tap them up for a few bob while we're there. Um, <laughs> Just tell me, I mean they'll, they'll do an awful lot for a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant well it would be nice to share some wine with you in real life at some point thanks oh, everyone really nice. for coming and uh hopefully we'll see some of you next month thanks again sally thank you everyone